morning, good morning, good morning. I hope y'all are feeling good. It's a great Sunday morning. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Sam Lee, and I get the honor of getting to pastor our amazing young adults here at Christian Life Austin. What an honor. I love it. God is moving powerfully there. And I got to tell you guys that this Sunday is a very special day for me. The first time I'm able to speak on a, on a Sunday morning to you guys, to be able to bring the word to you guys this morning. And it's special to me because as some of you guys know, I actually grew up here at Christian Life Austin. And so I can remember moments as a child on Sunday mornings, falling asleep on the front row with my mother when I was a little kid on her lap on those red pews. I, I remember special significant moments like me giving my life to Jesus right at this stage. I remember special moments in my life where I accepted the Holy Spirit in this very room. I, I remember the struggles and the challenges in my identity and not being sure who I was and struggling with a lot of that in this very room. And I remember hearing people, great men and women of faith, preach from this very stage and, and it moving my heart and forever changing my life forever. And, and so it is a special honor for me to be able to be here today and get to preach behind so many of my heroes and so many of my pastors and so, more, so many of my mentors. And it is an honor for me to get to pastor here at Christian Life Austin. I love this family. I love you guys so very much. Well, let's get into this thing. Over the past several weeks, Pastor Brad has been in this series called the Hall of Fame, where we've been taking a look at several key biblical heroes, if you will, of the faith from the Old Testament that are accounted in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Some people refer to this chapter as the Hall of Faith because the author of Hebrews recounts so many of the heroes we read about in the Old Testament. It talks about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and Rahab and, and Joshua and David and so many of the people that many of us in this room are familiar with today. But I think it's important for us to realize something about our speaker this morning, that our speaker in this moment, of the speaker of Hebrews, is not speaking to the Gentiles in this time. This is the New Testament. This is after Jesus has come and he's ascended. And he's specifically speaking to Jewish, the Jewish, those who would consider themselves to be Jews by culture and biologically to be Jews. They're the only ones who these people of faith would really even matter to. Those who were Gentiles wouldn't have any understanding or context for who Joseph was or who David was or, or who Solomon was. They wouldn't understand any of these people. And so he's specifically speaking to those who were Jews, people who probably grew up hearing these stories, people who understood that, that these, these stories were people who were a part of their lineage. It was a part of their family. It was a part of their history. And so when I'm reading this particular portion of scripture, I imagine a family. I imagine a family sitting down at a dining room table together. I imagine a family sitting in a living room recounting and remembering family members, recounting and remembering people of faith in their family, ancestors, great-great-grandmothers, great-great-grandfathers. And, and, and so it leads me to ask you the question today, who is in your hall of fame? Who is it that you remember that had great faith in your family? Maybe it is someone who's a great-great-grandmother or great-great-grandfather who migrated here to America so that your family could have a better life. And maybe they endured through, through prejudice or racism, but they were known for how they loved Jesus. Maybe it is a grandmother or grandfather who, when you went over to their home, their home and their halls were filled with prayer because they constantly prayed day and night for their children and for their family and for their grandchildren. Maybe it's a father who set an example for what it looks like to lead and to be like Jesus, or maybe it's a mother who set an example for what it looks like to love like Jesus. And her hugs just reminded you, every single time that you hugged her, it reminded you that everything was going to be okay. See, I don't know who is in your hall of fame, but I think it's important for us to remember these people. It's, it's important for us to remember those who came before us. It's important for us to remember those who had great faith, and because of their great faith, we're here today. It's important for us. So who's in your hall of fame? See, I don't know where you're at today on this spectrum of faith. Maybe you're here today and you're not even sure if you believe in Jesus. Maybe you're not even sure if the words that we sang here just a few moments ago even matter if they're real. 
Maybe you're here in the room today and you're new to the faith and you're just exploring, you're trying to figure out your faith and you're trying to grow in your faith or maybe you've been a part of the faith for a long time, but it seems like the challenges that are facing you right now in this season of your life are the most critical and the hardest challenges you've ever faced in your entire life. Well, here's what I've come to do today. I've come to stir up your faith. My hope is that no matter what end of the spectrum you're on, whether you have a lot of faith or a little faith or you're lacking in faith, my hope and my prayer, my belief is that during this time, your faith would be stirred up, that you would leave this room with a greater measure of faith. That's what I'm praying and I'm believing. I have the spiritual gifting of encouragement and the spiritual gift of faith. And so my hope is that I can use that today for anyone in the room who's saying, I need a little bit more faith in the room. Your faith is important. Your faith is powerful. Did you know that your faith has the ability to, to engage and, and has the uh, uh, ability to activate miracles in your very life? Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, everything is possible for who? The one who believes. The one who has faith. So your faith can take something from being natural to being supernatural. Your faith can take something from being possible to impossible back to being possible. That's what your faith can do. Not only does your faith do that, but it actually moves the heart of God. Did you know that without faith, it is, it is impossible to please God? And so if you came in today thinking you were going to please God by how good you were... <laughs> If you came in today thinking you were going to please God by how perfect you were, in the first service, I pronounced the word wrong. <laughs> and I thought, praise God. God uses all the words we pronounce right and all the words we pronounce wrong. doesn't matter. Faith, this is all that matters. Just a couple of moments ago, I was over there and I was praising during our powerful time of worship. It was amazing, wasn't it? It was awesome. It was powerful. <laughs> and I was... I was getting a little bit rowdy. I don't know about you guys, but I get a little bit rowdy in worship, right? I start dancing. I start jumping. I start putting my hands up. I do all the things. I dance. Why? Because this is a celebration. Every time I come to church, it's a celebration. This is what it is. This is what you do at a celebration, right? You dance. So I'm over there dancing and jiving and all the things, and I have a cough drop in my mouth. <laughs> Wrong move. I, I was jumping. I was dancing. I was like, praise God. And then out shoots the, the cough drop. I was like, Where's it at? I'm looking around like this. I'm like, did anybody see me? What's going on? I'm like checking my pocket. Like, did he go in my pocket? I'm like looking around on the ground, like trying to praise God. Like, where you, where's that thing at? <laughs> Holy Spirit, would you just bring it forward to me right now? <laughs> Reached down, grabbed the napkin. I picked it up. I found it, right? And I just thought, man, I'm so glad that I don't have to worship perfect. See, he's not looking for people who are perfect. He's not looking for people who know all the answers. He's not looking for people who know all the Bible. All he's looking for is someone with a little bit of faith who's got some faith in the room today. Your faith is activating the impossible. Your faith is moving the heart of God. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to stir up somebody's faith this morning. Turn over to your neighbor and say, stir up your faith. The title of my message for today is Stir Up Your Faith. It's time for us to stir up our faith. I know there's a lot going on in the world. I know there's a lot of evil. I know there's a lot of division. I know there's a lot of hatred. I know many of you guys are experiencing hardship right now in this season of your life. But I'm here to tell you right now, it's not, ch it's not time for the church to draw back. It's not time for us to doubt. It's not time for us to, to, to lack in our faith. Right now is the time for the church to stand up and stand on the word of God and believe that what God says and his promises are yes and amen and they will come to pass. That's the faith. That's the faith. We're going to be in John chapter 5. Let's get into this thing. John chapter 5 tells this story and it's a miracle and I believe that by looking at this miracle and unpacking this miracle, it really will stir up your faith in this very room. But John chapter 5 begins, Jesus is towards the beginning of his ministry and he as many times we can see in the Bible, is, has found himself in an unlikely place, <laughs> a place that none of us would find ourselves at. John chapter 5, verse 1 says this, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Verse 2, Now they're in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Verse 3, here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. 
So Jesus steps into this moment. Let's just pause for a second. He steps into this moment where there's several people with sicknesses and with illnesses. I mean, you can imagine. And, and, and I got to be honest with you. I wouldn't naturally, just on a casual day, find myself surrounded by people with a bunch of sicknesses and illnesses. This is not where I would want to be. Matter of fact, when I go to the hospital, I have this internal rule inside of me. Here's my rule. I don't look to the left. I don't look to the right. I keep my eyes forward. I go to see the person that I wanted to see. I don't want to see anybody else. Because the moment I start looking around in different people's rooms and looking behind curtains, I don't want to see any blood. I don't want to see anyone puking or vomiting. I don't, I don't want to see something I, I, that's going to ingrain into my mind for the rest of my life. I do not want to see it. And so I keep my eyes forward when I'm going to the doctor's office or going to a hospital to visit someone. I don't want to see any of it. Last time I was there, I broke the rule on accident. And I looked over. I'm just walking down. just having a great day, man. You know, going to see a good friend of mine. I look over to the left, and there in the window, there's a man laying on his back, I mean peacefully. And in the next 0.5 seconds, the man is up, he's like, ah, like this, he's, like, he's on the table, just like, ah, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like, oh, I'm keeping forward, I'm just going to keep on moving, I'm like, come on, I'm just, just got to get by this guy, I don't want to see, I don't want to know what's going on with him, I don't look behind nobody's curtain and see, I, I don't want to see what's going on, but Jesus... <laughs> Isn't he so interesting? Jesus always finds himself in the places where no one else wants to go. <laughs> he finds himself here with people who are looking for a healing. And why are they here? They're here because there's this belief that the pool of Bethesda, when it's stirred up, if someone is able to get into this pool, they will be healed. And so around the Pool of Bethesda, I think we have a picture of what this might look like. Around the Pool of Bethesda, there's several people who are hurting. There are several people who are sick. There are several people who are in need. I mean, just imagine the smells. I mean, imagine the sounds that you're hearing here. Imagine the moaning and the groaning. And this is exactly where Jesus finds himself is right here with these people who are in need. And they're waiting there so that they can be healed. See, there's several different theories on why people were coming to this pool and what the whole situation with the pool was. Some people believe that this pool was fed by an underwater spring, that when it would start to move, it would bubble the waters. And so people thought, when the water bubbles, I'm going to get into it as fast as I can so I can be healed. Some people believe that, that this pool was actually being stirred by spirits, not the Spirit of God, other spirits because there are other spirits and these other spirits are stirring up the pool and there's several people who are sitting around this pool and they're praying to their idols and they're and they're summoning different spirits and they're here this is one of the theories that they have and other theories just say this is just superstition there wasn't anything real at all I don't know what the truth is I wasn't there I didn't see it I didn't experience it but here's what we do know that people believed that if they got into the water they would be healed and this is why so many people would surround around this pool day and night, every single day, finding their way there. And I believe this is the perfect picture of our society and the perfect picture of our culture. Did you know that our society and our culture is looking for something? Our society and our culture is searching for something. If you haven't been able to acknowledge that, then, then, then you might want to look a little bit deeper. People are looking for healing. People are looking for answers. People are looking for relief. And they're looking for it in all of the places. They're looking for it in a screen. They're looking for it in a relationship. They're looking for it in crystals. They're looking for it in tarot card reading. They're looking for it in, in, in friendships. They're looking for it in their job. They're looking for it in all the different places. And this is the image that we see at the Pool of Bethesda. People are sitting here waiting for their opportunity. And here's the deal. As they're all searching for it, we all know the only thing that can save, the only thing that can heal, the only thing that can set you apart, the only thing that can restore is Jesus. That is the only thing. We don't have to get into a pool. We can just get into the presence of God. But here's the deal. I don't judge them. I don't judge the people for sitting around this pool for so long. I don't, I don't judge them. And I don't even judge the people who are doing it right now. Actually, matter of fact, I'm actually inspired by them. Because while they're searching day and night, day and night, hoping to be able to get into this pool, hoping to find an answer and a solution, here's what I realize as Christians we do. We have the answer, but we pick and choose when we want it. 
We got the presence of God. We can step right into it the morning that we wake up right then and there. But we don't. We don't come to church whenever we feel like we're tired or we feel like there's something more important. But the whole entire world is searching and they're looking. And so I'm sitting here and I'm inspired that people are sitting here for 10 years every single day. People who are lame, people who are sick, people who have been ill. They're finding a way to be able to get to this pool. And here's my question. Who's desperate enough to say, I want to get into the presence of God every single day. And I want my family to know that as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. (laughs) Who's desperate to get into the presence of God? And for some of us, it's just become so familiar. (laughs) So we've forgotten the power and the presence of God. But here the people wait every day, waiting for an answer. And if you want, if you want your faith to be stirred up, you got to get desperate. You got to get desperate for a move of God. See, after this moment right here, it kind of zooms into a particular character we're going to take a look at right here. Verse 5 says this, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. 38 years. What does this mean? It means that he had suffered from a sickness. He had suffered from an illness. Some people believe that he was paralyzed in some ways and unable to move for 38 years. Now, we don't know if he went to this pool for 38 years, but we know that he suffered for 38 years. What a long time. See, but the first thing that I I notice as I'm reading this scripture right here and they're referring to this man, there's no name for him. They just call him an invalid. Now, I don't know about you, but if my story was in the Bible, I would have just hoped, could you just make up a name? Like, could you have just asked me what my name was instead of just saying, oh, this invalid, this man with this sickness, like, just give me some kind of a name. Just give me, give me Bob, give me Joey, give me, give me whatever, Trayvon, like whatever name it is, just give me a name. Don't put my, my story in the Bible and don't give me a name. Just got to be honest with you. I'd be a little bit offended by this, by them not giving me a name. Call me Aura. Aura's a great man right here. He's sitting on the front row. He's awesome. He has some great faith. Just give me a name. But they gave him no name. What does this mean? In this time, in this culture, your name meant everything. Your name told your financial standing. Your name told who your family was. Your name told what kind of job you worked. Your name told your value. And so we can assume that because this man had no name and they only identified him as the invalid, that he probably held no value in their society. Now watch this. This is the beautiful thing. Jesus comes to a place where people have no name. Jesus comes to a place where people have no value. Jesus goes to a man who's only known by the invalid. And he comes to him, and you know what he says? He says, you know what? In this society, maybe you have no value, but I'm about to show you how valuable you are. I'm going to show you what your life is worth. I'm about to go on the cross, and I'm about to pay the ultimate price for your life because I love you. Someone needs to realize that in the room today. If you felt like you have no value, no one cares about you, no one sees you, There's a God in heaven today. He said, you are worth it all. And that's why I sent my son for you. But see, I think a lot of times like this man, we can get used to these titles. I'm sure the man was okay being called the invalid. He had been known as this, and, and I'm sure he had accepted this name and just known, yeah, I'm the invalid. That's what I am. I'm sick. I'm lame. That's who I am. That's my name. I think he had gotten so used to it and he had got so caught up in his condition that he allowed himself to be identified by his condition. Now, I think that we see this in our culture today. I think we see this in our church today. We so casually allow ourselves to be identified based off of our condition. Let me give you guys an example. I've talked to several people, invited them out, say, hey, you should come to Young Adults. Hey, you should come visit my church. Hey, you should come to this space. And you know what they tell me a lot of times is, oh, I can't go to that place. I have too much anxiety. I have too much anxiety. And so if I went to that place, then, then, then I would have a panic attack. I can't go there because my anxiety won't allow me to go there. You're being identified by your condition. Oh, man, I'm just always getting sick. I heard the flu's coming around. I guess I'm probably going to end up getting it this year. I mean, I always do. I'm going to have to take five days off work. It's going to be so miserable. Maybe. (laughs) 
You're identifying. Oh, I'm just, I'm just terrible with my money. I always have a hole in my pocket. I just spend tons and tons of money. Man, I just swipe my credit card. It's just who I am. Every week they're showing up with a new bag, with a new shoes, with something new. We're so quick to casually identify with our condition. And hear me right when I say this. I don't think anybody should be ashamed. I'm not saying, hey, you should cover up some of the issues that you have in your life. No, I'm actually an advocate for transparency. I am. But here's what I am saying, that identifying with your condition will not save you. The only one who can save you is Jesus. And so instead of identifying with the condition, it's time for you to identify with the miracle working God. There's a lot of different names you can put on yourself. There's so many different labels out there nowadays. And you choose whatever label you want. But here's the deal. This is the label I choose, a child of God, a son of the most high, called and set apart. This is what I choose to identify with. Your words have power. I spoke on this a couple of weeks ago at Young, at young Adults. I won't get into it. But did you know there's the power of life and death in your tongue? What does that mean? We say it so many times, but yet we don't understand that when you speak negativity, when you speak these things over yourself, you can expect to see that in your life. But when you speak the promises of God by faith over your life, you might be able to say, you know what? I struggled with anxiety, but you know what? I believe God is setting me apart. I'm no longer going to struggle with anxiety. Yeah, I used to have that sickness, and it feels like it always comes back. But by the name of Jesus, I'm set free because who the sun set free is free indeed. Be careful what you speak over yourself. Be careful what you speak over your family. Be careful what you speak over your, your life. If you want to stir up your faith, you've got to identify with the miracle working God. Verse 6 goes on and it says this. When Jesus saw him, the invalid, lying there, and he had learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him a, sim a simple question. Do you want to get well? I'm going to be honest, if I had had a sickness for 38 years and Jesus said, do you want to get well? I might get a little tone. <laughs> I might get a little sassy. I'm a, excuse me? What? Don't you know? I, I've had this for 38. What do you think? You think I'm just sitting around here at this pool, just coming here for a social hangout? What's up, Mike? How you doing? Still sick? Ah, oh, good to hear. Great to see you. See you next week. No. I'm not just coming here for no reason. Right? <laughs> He says, do you want to get well? Watch how the man responds to this. Verse 7, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. I think this moment tells us everything about this man. Jesus asks a simple question. Do you want to get well? And the response of the man is all of the reasons why he can't get well. You know people like this? This might be you. There's healing for you. Ah, but, you know, this, always, this is always running my family line, so it's probably what I'm always going to deal with. Hey, God is setting you apart. Yeah, but that's just not my personality. I, I'm, I'm always, uh, this is just who I am. This is, this, is, this is the kind of thoughts that come into my mind. They're always going to be intrusive thoughts in my mind. He's just saying, do you want to get well? That's the only thing that he's asking. And, and the man starts responding by all the reasons. I can't get into the water. No one helps me in. Everyone always gets in front of me. For 38 years, I'm sure he's crushed. I'm sure he's defeated. I'm sure he's hopeless, as some people in this room might be. But Jesus is asking a very simple question to some people in this room. Do you want to be healed? This is the question that he's asking. And while the man is so concerned with the pool getting stirred up, Jesus is trying to stir up his faith in this very moment. He's trying to say, don't wait on some pool to get stirred up. I'm trying to stir up your faith that you could receive a healing in this very moment right now. And so this is what I've come to tell you guys today. It's time for us to stir up our faith. You know, your faith can get stagnant. Your faith can get stale. Some of us, the last faith decision we made was to follow Jesus, and we've made no other faith decisions after that. What is faith? Believing. 
It's believing even when it seems like it's impossible. It's believing that there's something greater out there despite what you can see right in front of you. Being able to see on a spiritual plane instead of being able to see in a physical plane. So it's time for us to stir up our faith. I served under a, an amazing leader by the name of Darla Shirley. She's the owner of a nonprofit in Oak Cliff, South Dallas. I served with her for six years under her vision and worked with her. And she was a woman of faith. There's no person in this whole entire world that I've known who has the same amount of faith as she has. And she's encouraged and she's inspired my faith. And oftentimes, whenever our team would start to get down or when it seemed like it wasn't going to happen, she would pull out her, her faith stirring stick. <laughs> and she would say, it's time to stir up our faith. When things weren't going well, she would pull out her faith stirring stick. For some of you guys, this is like punishment. Like, put your hand. No, no, no. This is, this is not what this is about. You got you to, you know, think about it in a different way, type of way. Deconstruct it. <laughs> she would say, it's time to stir up our faith. And here's what I've come to tell you today. It's time for us to stir up our faith. It's time for us to believe again. Maybe some of you guys have been hurt because you haven't seen the miracle. Maybe some of you guys have been hurt by what you've seen about the church. Maybe you guys don't believe because you haven't seen it actually take place in your life. But I'm here to say to the very person in this room whose faith has maybe grown stagnant and it's maybe grown stale, it's time that we freshen up your faith a little bit by stirring up your faith. I'm believing right now in the name of Jesus, whoever would receive it, your faith is being stirred up to new heights, to new levels. It's time to stir up your faith. See, I think that the reason why we don't allow God to stir up our faith is we're very similar to the man. See, the man was so concerned with the method that he was willing to miss out on the miracle. The man was so concerned, I've got to wait until the water gets stirred up for me to get healed. And Jesus, the miracle working God, is right there saying, do you want to get healed? You know, oftentimes I think to myself, had Jesus asked him, hey, do you want to get healed? And the man said, well, I'm waiting on the water to be stirred up. What if Jesus was like, all right, peace out. You, you good? I mean, just imagine this. He's sitting here and he's saying, hey, you ready to get healed? And the man's like, ah, yeah, I do, but this water's not getting stirred up. All right, enjoy that right there, buddy. I'll see you later. Just imagine if this is what Jesus would have said. And I think... For so many of us in this room, that's exactly what's happening in our life. Is Jesus is here and he's saying, I'm ready to do a miracle in your life. And you're saying, but the method. <laughs> but this is how I want it to happen. But this is how I want my miracle. But this is how I want my blessing. And Jesus is saying, guess what? The healing is right here if you want it. And we're saying, you know what? I'm good. I want it to happen in a certain type of a way. Hey, I want to heal you right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to get healed. I want to get healed. And he says, hey, come down to the front and get prayed over during our time of prayer. Ah, uh, well, I don't, I don't really want to go down there. People might see me. People might think differently of me. I, I mean, my knee's kind of hurting a little bit today. I sat really far away. And I'm like, why would you sit so far away? Come in closer. Get down here. Get ready to get your miracle. But because you do it like this, and he's like, no, that's the way. <laughs> God, I need you to provide for me. And he says, yeah, I've had the miracle of providing for you for so long. I've just been waiting for you to start being generous and start giving back and actually move into the job that I have for you. And we're like, yeah, but you know, I don't really trust the church with my money. I'm not really sure if that's really for me. I don't think I, I want to do that. And this job that I'm in, it seems awfully comfortable. I want to stay right here. Can you just bless me right here? He's like, nah. You get so caught up on the method and you'll miss out on the miracle. And you know what? I sympathize with the men. I've been there before, so caught up on the method. God, will you do it this way? God, will you do it this way that I'm missing out on his way that he wants to do it? And a lot of times we're like this man because for the man, the only way that he had ever seen this miracle take place was by people getting into the pool. And this blinded him. This blinded him to the miracle worker who was two inches away from him because he was so focused on getting into the pool. Don't get so focused on how it happened before. 
I think this can be the biggest issue and the biggest problem in the church is we get so focused on how God did it before. And you may have come in today with your preconceived notions thinking, well, guess what? The type of trauma that I deal with, Sam, it only happens through years and years and years of therapy. Well, here's what I know. In a blink of an eye, God can do some therapy on your life and he can turn that situation around and he can heal you from whatever trauma, no matter the depth, no matter how bad it was, no matter how evil it was. Well, Sam, I've, I've, typically whenever I go through this sickness, I have to use this medication. And I'm not speaking against medication, but I believe that maybe God is saying, baby boy, baby girl, I understand that. I don't need you to be addicted to some medication, be addicted to my spirit, be addicted to my presence. Watch me come in and heal you in an instant. You won't need any medicine for the rest of your life. I hear this so many times in different churches and different places. Man, we just need the old Pentecostal fire back. Man, we just need those tent revivals to come back. We just need those Holy Ghost pastors to start stirring it up. We, we, just, we just need to go, go to a deliverance conference. We just need to go over there and do that and do that. And, 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 and here's the deal. None of those things are bad, but here's what I believe God is saying. He's saying, don't get so caught up on the method. Don't forget, I didn't come because there was a tent meeting. I didn't come because it was Billy Graham. I didn't come because there was some deliverance conference. I came because people had faith enough to stir it up, and I stepped in, and I did what I did. So I'll move in someone's dorm apartment. I'll move in your house. I'll move in a church. I'll move in a Bible study. I'll move wherever people of faith are saying, God, I have faith to believe. It's time to stir up your faith. Lean over to your neighbor and say, stir up your faith. God will do it however he wants to do it. Amen. Sometimes we get confused. We think we're God. <laughs> you got to do it like this. You got to do it how I want you to do it. What if you walked out today and you were sick and a little kid who was over in our kids uh, worship experience right now came over and they prayed over you and you got healed. He can do it however he wants, with a little kid, with a baby, with whoever he wants to do it with. But you know what you could do? You could get up from that moment and be like, oh, that was so cute. All right, bye, and still, still limping. You could do that if you don't have faith. But I have the faith to believe that our kids over there can pray a prayer over me that heals me from years and years and years of pain. I believe it. God will use whatever he wants to use. So what happens after this? Verse 8, then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once, this man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. Praise God. The miracle happened. The miracle happened, but it still required faith. Let's pause for a second. Jesus will do the miracle, but what's your faith step? See, the man had to have at least started to move over or turn a little bit. He had to start to move his knees. He had to start to move his toes a little bit. There had to be a step of faith for the man to be able to see the miracle. See, Jesus, I believe he'll come down and he'll do the miracle, but it's up to you to say, I'm going to take a step of faith. I'm actually going to believe that I'm healed. I'm actually going to believe that that situation's been turned around. I'm going to actually believe that he's blessed my family. I'm actually going to believe it, so I'm going to take a faith step. What is your faith step? The man had to take a faith step in order to see the healing. Let me tell you a story as we're closing. It's a story of a young couple. They were expecting their second child. Their first child was probably around seven years old at the time. And they were, they were going through the, the process and everything was great. The baby was healthy. Everything was fine. Until just a couple of months before the baby came along. And the doctors noticed something. They noticed that the baby's spine was disconnected through x-rays. And so, so immediately the doctors began to tell her that her child would be paralyzed from the waist down. Wouldn't be able to use his legs. And so I'm sure this young couple walked out, maybe confused and unsure. Maybe a little bit afraid, as many of us would be in this room. But the first thing they did was they started to take some faith steps. They started to get some people around them and say, hey, we gotta pray. They started to get their church around them and say, hey, we gotta pray. They started to get their family around them and say, we gotta pray that this child will be healed. The baby comes along and when the baby comes out, they, the doctors remind the family 
This child will never walk. But the family knew that there's a miracle working God out there. And so the, the child had to wear a cast for the first six months of his life. After those first six months of his life, he went in to do his first surgery, which was a very unique and a special surgery that they hadn't done very often. And after they had done the surgery, once again, the doctor said, I want to remind you guys, the child will never walk. At 18 months, about a year after the surgery, the family re-enters into that doctor's office and there's no baby in their arms. They're walking down the hall. If you just look down and glance down, you see the little baby waddling down the hall, making his way, moving his legs, walking down the hall. So much that the doctors, all those who knew about the procedure and everything, they went door to door, started knocking on all of the doctor's doors. You gotta come out, getting the nurses out of, out, of the, out of the middle of their appointments. And they stood on the hall and they stood with amazement and disbelief as the child came waddling down the hall. A child who they said would never walk. A child who they said would be in a wheelchair. A child who they said would be paralyzed. That child came walking down the hall and they sat, the couple sat in the room with a surgeon who was in disbelief. And you know what he said about the child? He said, this is a miracle child. And so from that day on, when the family came to visit, they had several checkups. There was another surgery that followed after. But from that day on, all the doctors and all the nurses said, that's the miracle child. Nurses who didn't believe in Jesus, Nurses who, who, who had never been to church before. Doctors who, who never believed that God could do something like this off of their mouth are saying that's a miracle child walking down. And I can tell you right now, that child grew up. He participated in sports. The child grew up. He was in the band. The child grew up. He did weightlifting. He did everything that all the other kids could do. And his last checkup was when he was in high school in which the doctor said to him, your back is stronger than the natural human being. It's completely restored. It's completely strong. And so imagine 18 years of him coming in and people saying, that's the miracle child. That's the miracle child. That's the miracle child. That's what happens when you start to take some faith steps. And here's what I want to tell you right here today. The church that prayed over that kid is in this room right here. This is that church. And I'm telling you right now, that child was me. They said I would never walk. They said I would never run. They said I'd never jump. They said I'd never dance. But look at me now because somebody got their faith stirred up and they took a faith step. It's time for you to take a faith step. Stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. God will do it for you. He's done it for me. He's done it for people in this very room right here. Because someone decided to take a faith step. What faith step are you gonna to take today? It's going to change your family. It's going to change their life. Praise God. Is my, is my dad here? Is he on the stage? Come here, Because of his faith steps, I can take some real steps in the natural. What an amazing service that we just experienced. So grateful for the presence of the Lord that met us in the house today. And on behalf of our pastoral team, our leadership team, and our entire staff, we want to say thank you for tuning in to Christian Life Austin Online. And we pray that this service remains in your heart and helps lead you on your next steps on this beautiful faith journey that you're on. 
And listen, this is a, a very important moment in our service. This is not just something that we, we do, but it's something that means so much to us. If you've just been a part of our online service, we want to give you the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life if you have yet to do so. So maybe you're watching in your living room, maybe it's in your kitchen, or maybe you're even on vacation. Here's what we know, that Jesus will meet you right where you are. In fact, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 says it this way, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So if you want salvation today, it's as simple but as powerful as confessing Jesus is Lord of your life and having faith that God raised him from the dead. So I want to take a moment and just say a prayer, and I want you to pray that as well. Maybe you're going to pray words that, that are your own words, or maybe you're going to pray exactly what I pray, but I want, you, I want you to pray something from your heart. And so let's pray together. Lord, we love you today. Thank you. Thank you for the word that has just gone forth, that has, has turned our hearts to you in a new and a fresh way. And Lord, I know, I know there's people that are saying today, that I don't know you in the way that I want to know you, that I've never made you the Lord of my life, but, but today that changes. Today, in this moment, right now, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want, I want you to take control of every aspect of my life, so I surrender my heart to you today. I believe that you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again, and I believe that I'm ready to follow you with everything that I have from this day forward. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. Come on, let me give you a big congratulations to everyone who made the decision to follow Jesus today. All of heaven is celebrating with you and your church family is celebrating with you as well. But hey, we know that this is only one step. We want you to know that you're not alone on this walk. And we're not leaving you to figure it out all by yourself. We as a church want to partner with you through our core values of knowing God, finding freedom, discovering purpose, and making a difference in the lives of others. And we would love to help you take your next step. Whether it's water baptism, maybe joining a life group or getting plugged in through serving with our growth track. We have everything that you need to make this process easy, accessible, and applicable to you and your life, no matter what stage of life that you're in. You are somebody at Christian Life Austin, and you are somebody to the kingdom of God. We want to know what your next step is, and we also want to hear from you if you gave your life to Jesus today. So here's what you do. Just click the link in the description so that we can get connected with you. Again, thanks so much for tuning in, and we can't wait to see you in person at Christian Life Austin.